Aretha Franklin came from a lawyer who represented her. I didn't know her. And the lawyer would like me and put me in touch with her brother, who was his reverend in Cleveland. And I convinced him for however I did it. And the minute I got her, I turned her over to an agent who would understand her, because that was not my strength. But uh, Sam Cook, one of the record company owners, told me about a record breaking out in Detroit. You know, records used to break in one city or another city, and then the disc jockeys would pick up on it and start to play it. And I chased him, and I... It's a great story. He's coming. His manager... I said I wasn't going to do stories. His manager is named Bumps Blackwell. And I get him on the phone, and I tell him why I want to represent Sam Cooke, blah, blah, blah. And I make an appointment to see him Thursday at 730 now, singers and record singers, especially in the African-American world, were notoriously never showed up or were late. It didn't matter what time you said. They'd pop in whenever they felt like it. So I'm sitting in my office with my assistant, and he's not showing up. And I don't know what to do, because I don't know where to find him. And I called. There was a hangout on 54th Street called Alan Dick's Restaurant, which was the hangout for the music world. And I speak to the bartender, and everybody hung out there. And I said, uh, I didn't know what I was going to say because I didn't think he'd know who Bumps Blackwell was. So I name a publisher. I said, is Goldie Goldmark there? He says, yeah. So Goldie gets on the phone. I tell him who it is, yeah. He says, you got any idea where Bumps Blackwell is? And he says to me, yeah, he's sitting in my boss's office. Now, his boss was not only a publisher, he was an agent. So the guy I'm waiting to see is sitting in another agent's office. Now, I don't know what to do. And where I came up with this inspiration, <laughs> stupid, I said to my assistant, get Bumps Blackwell on the phone at this guy's office. And I get on the phone and I impersonate an, a black comic whose name was Timmy Rogers. And I do a terrible impression of Timmy Rogers. And I say to Bumps, it's Timmy. I'm doing this, right? You better get your ass over here because I can't wait any longer. No, and I, and after I get him on the phone, I tell the girl, it's Timmy Rogers. He gets on the phone. I said, it's our back. You better get over here now because I can't wait anymore. I'm not going to wait, blah, blah, blah. And I pull him out of an agent's office. That's how I signed Sam Cook. By impersonating Timmy Rogers. By impersonating Timmy Rogers. Timmy Rogers never knew what I did. Maybe I told him later on. Did you, you know from Timmy Rogers? Sure. Flagellava is his big thing. That's how I pulled him out of another agent's office. We started to sign people who needed work. And we had to find ways of getting them out on the concert tour or playing one-nighters. I mean, Sam Cooke, I went and called an agent at another agency, and I said, I need dates. I'm, what can you give me? He said, I can get you dates at $1,000 a night. I said, great, I'll take it. Now, I'm sure he was getting 2000 a night, but I didn't care. Sam Cooke was working. He was getting 1000 a night. This agent today is at William Morris. That's 30, 40 years later. I had lunch with him the other day. But he was booking Sam Cooke for me. So I looked good. I was keeping Sam Cooke working. And the object was, in my opinion, to try to take some of these performers and convert them to being from just a record singer to being a top performer where they can play the Cobra Commander and, and, and then the top clubs in the country in Vegas, whatever. So I would work with them on developing an act and then book them into the Cobra or whatever and see if they could make the transition. That was the game plan. There was resistance. It was it was a subtle resistance. Nobody would tell you I'm not going to play them because of their color, but they weren't eagerly, you know, getting them. Except when their records became so big, they couldn't say no. I mean, we had Sam Cooke on the on the on, on, on the Ed Sullivan show, and he couldn't care less. But he he knew he had certain popularity, and Ed Sullivan was notorious for it, for poor timing. Never knew how much show to book, and was always running over or cutting performers while the show was on. It was, it was drastic. And I'm standing back there with Sam Cooke, and I'm realizing they're not going to get her in. And as it comes down from, it was 8, eight o'clock, 8 to 9, as it comes down closer to 9 o'clock, I'm getting nervous. There's nothing I can do about it. And sure enough, Sullivan says, and here he is, Sam Cooke. Sam Cooke comes out and says, Darling, you send me. The first four words of the song, off the air. And he's panicking. I says, the best thing that happened. He says, what do you mean? He says, he's going to buy you back now. He's going to have to bring you back, which he did three weeks later. But Sullivan was notorious. He didn't know how to time a show. So that was my story with Sam Cooke on that show. Uh, 
when he came back, did he do all of you since? Yeah, he did. He finished. He did the whole song. <laughs> okay, so good. he had two appearances within four weeks, even though the first one was four words. But there was, well, there was resistance to, to black entertainers and in, in their personal appearances in the clubs. I mean, they couldn't stay in the same hotel. They couldn't, you know, they they'd buy him and then hide him. And they, you know, they didn't treat him very well.